We're on to the 12th of June, with the wings still pulling low cover duty over the eastern assault area, with the occasional excursion out of the area, as we'll take a look at here in a bit. So let's go through the squadron summaries. On four occasions during the day, the squadron acted as low cover over the eastern assault area. On the second operation of the day, one tire of the aircraft flown by Flight Officer Graham blew, causing the aircraft ground loop and seriously injuring the pilot. Flight Officer Graham was admitted to St. Richard's Hospital, suffering from a broken back. On the third operation, Pilot Officer West attempted to bail out of his aircraft. The parachute, however, caught in his tailwheel, carrying the pilot down with the aircraft. He is considered missing, believed killed. Now, 442 gives us sky clear, bright sun on dawn readiness, but no early patrol. The pilots who went to Red Hill returned with the planes at 1030 hours. Those pilots leaving yesterday to fetch three new Spitfires. Items in the London dailies about the first spits in France, but copies scarce. One group picture showing Flight Officer Campbell, and this photo I've been unable to track down. Movies taken at 11.30 as the squadron was led by the OC. Flight Officer Graham of the 441 Squadron blew a tire and turned over, injuring his back. We have marked out here Flight Lieutenant Trot, an early return, trouble with trim, quiet patrol. Afternoon takeoff at 15.35, Pilot Officer O'Sullivan returned shortly. When oil covered his windshield, again, that one's marked out. Another uneventful patrol. Third patrol, 1950 to 2145, all quiet. Total hours, getting back up there again, 71. It mentions movies taken at 1130 here. This again, I've been unable to locate after a brief search. And yeah, that's just on the list of things to keep an eye out for as we go here. Now, 443 gives us weather clear and warm, ceiling and visibility unlimited, 12 aircraft took part in four low-cover patrols today. No incident reported and no casualty of any of our aircraft. Daily newspapers today carried pictures of the first wing to land in France, being 144 wing. Two pilots of our squadron, quite visible in the picture, and that would have been almost certainly this photo that I found within the Imperial War Museum collection after I thought I was done with this video. This is from the 10th and is part of the same set that I showed on the video describing activities on the 10th. Top center, we see squadron leader J.G. Edison, described as the senior flying control officer. So this is just sort of the mobile air traffic control slash command center for the airfield. And then seated to his left, you can see the wing commander, Johnny Johnson, as well as pilots. And I'm already, after what's it been, two weeks, starting to recognize some of these guys by sight. That would be squadron leader Dow Russell, bottom center. 442 Squadron Commander, and I'm sure as we go, more and more of these faces will start to stick out to me, and I'll be able to include more photos like this that I almost completely skipped in, given the account here. Squadron prepared to move to France at short notice, both the airlift party with personnel and equipment, and the Spitfire escort. It says here, ops time, 102 hours. My goodness. And I peeked ahead to flying time for the rest of the month. It's rare to see any of these squadrons above 30 hours after this day. So this might have just been the straw that broke the camel's back when it came to big surges and operations like this. But I'll get into the missions for the day now. 0620 to 0825. This is 441 and 443 squadron going up on a low cover patrol over the eastern assault area. 441 gives us the squadron was low cover over the eastern assault area. The mission was again uneventful. 443 gives us 12 aircraft dispatched as low cover over the eastern assault beachhead. No enemy aircraft seen during the patrol, nor flak encountered. Weather clear, ceiling and visibility unlimited. 10 heavy tanks seen moving south. Head road, uniform 9662. And it says center of Lascent on fire. It's been a, a bit of a mystery. The best that I can figure is that is just a typo and that's actually Lasso that's on fire. That's the only town in the area that even comes close to the spelling right here, but in either case, yeah, town somewhere on fire. That would not be a strange occurrence at this time. Now, on to the second mission, 1120 to 1130. This is the entire wing sending up aircraft on this one. So 441 gives us the squadron's low cover over the eastern assault area. And this is the one where the tire on Flight Officer Graham's aircraft burst on takeoff, causing the aircraft to nose over onto its back. And the pilot was seriously injured and the aircraft cat E. 442 gives us uneventful 30 plus tanks parked and camouflaged 
Montilli, Tango 84, 68, 3 tenths cloud, 3 to 4,000 feet, visibility good, flak heavy from the area south of Bay Khan, and 443 gives us 12 aircraft dispatched on beachhead patrol, no enemy aircraft seen, heavy flak and scattered bursts from the area south of Bay and Khan area, sky clear, visibility unlimited, 30 heavy tanks parked and camouflaged again near Montilli, Tango, 84.68, and this is a good a place as any to go ahead and come in here and have a look. Now, we have the location we're dealing with outlined right here, and I'll back out just a bit and give some context for everything that's going on right here on this day. So tomorrow, we're going to get the Battle of villers bacage and I'll back out a little bit further so we can see the lines as of the 12th. That would make these tanks parked right here, 30-plus camouflaged, Elements of Panzer Lair Division. And you can see on this day, as well as tomorrow, they're going to be opposite the British 7th Armored Division, who, along with the 1st Infantry Division on the American side, are going to take advantage of the retreat of a German Infantry Division to move into the gap at Calmont and try to flank these German defenses lined up west of Caen, but I guess we'll, we'll look at some more info on that tomorrow. But this is the situation as it would have stood on the 12th, now, looking at imagery that's available for the 12th, we actually had a very good chance of picking these guys up. The imagery was just a little bit too far south, and this would have been just a strip of photos along those German lines in preparation for a big push to the south. And if we enable some imagery, I'll come in here to this exact location as it would have looked like on around the 20th of June. Now, those tanks would have been parked up here in this area, camouflaged. And you can see that since this date, this area was just pounded with artillery. Those little white pockmarks are artillery rounds that would have impacted this location. And you can see the tracks of vehicles and armor as they moved around these fields. And when looking at imagery like this and trying to pick out especially camouflage positions, you're not going to necessarily see the camouflage positions themselves. You're going to see the marks around it from vehicles moving into those camouflage positions. And in fact, just to the south, one of these photos taken on this day, on the 12th, gives a good example of what I'm talking about. If I were someone flying over the area, you know, I might get lucky and see something out in the open like this vehicle we can see on the road. But what I would really be looking for is something like this. We have this field here with trees and we have these tread marks leading to this location. Now, this could be armor and vehicles hidden under there or it could just be associated with the farm right here. But at the very least, that is where I would be looking for vehicles or armor camouflage. And the Germans at the time were very, very good at not leaving that sort of sign on the terrain. I mean, we see it up here, uh, very, very evident, because this is probably from the battle to take this area. But when just bedding down somewhere for the night or just digging into a location, the Germans and, well, everybody at the time would have been very, very careful about policing up the area and removing as much of the sign of their presence as possible. So for that reason, you know, we have, for example, in this a one compact location right here, just from here to Con, lined up two full Panzer divisions, and yet a flight or multiple flights flying over the area, all they really see is the occasional tanks camouflage. They may note some flak just generally in the area, 10 tanks moving on a road down here. So for the entire day of flying back and forth over this location, this is all that these squadrons saw. And that should tell, it tells me how good everybody was at keeping themselves hidden. So in either case, let me go ahead and move on to the next mission. And this one is 1540 to 1750. And I should note that on none of these missions are they landing at B3. They're just flying out, doing their patrol, and then flying back to Aria Ford. But other units on these days, Typhoon units, other Spitfire units, would have been using B-3 for rearming and refueling. So this mission, 441, this squadron was low cover over the Eastern Assault Area. On the return journey, Pilot Officer West was forced to bail out over the channel. His parachute caught on the tail of the aircraft carrying him under the water, and he has been reported as missing, believed killed. Now, it looks like 442 Squadron had an interesting time of it. It says, well, it says uneventful, but it does say four heavy guns towed by semi-tracked vehicles proceeding north on a road between Mayenne and Domfront, about five miles south of Domfront, another 15 parked on a road at approximately coordinates Yankee 2997. 
So this would have been towed artillery moving along these roads and coming up to reinforce the German divisions already there. And that's just a generic location right there, five miles south of the town, and then more over here. So apparently this squadron made their own little sweep out here to the south, probably on a reconnaissance mission. We've seen examples before on earlier days of the wing receiving a call from, it would have been a fighter direction tender, basically just command and control agency for this phase of the operation, working from a ship, using radar to look for enemy aircraft and then to direct flights to the right location. We've seen examples of them requesting the wing to send aircraft on reconnaissance patrols to other locations, and this was Squadron Leader Russell, who we have seen is a very experienced pilot, and I guess he's sort of emerging as one of the wing's rock stars, along with Johnny Johnson. So it seems likely that a situation like that would have happened here, with Russell taking some aircraft, or maybe just the aircraft of his squadron, down south on a sweep and a little reconnaissance. So, And then 443 gives us 13 aircraft took off on beachhead patrol, which proved uneventful. And then it uh, recounts the exact same thing as 442. So it could have been the entire wing coming down here on this sweep, or maybe just a few aircraft like I said. It doesn't really give that much detail. But that is it for the third mission of the day. And then the fourth mission is up at 1945, landing at about 2145. Another low cover over the eastern assault area. 442 gives us uneventful, no waiting the aircraft scene. Black heavy from the con area, as has become the norm. Then 443 wraps up the day with 13 aircraft dispatched on beachhead patrol, two returned early, one with RT trouble, receiver transmitter or radio trouble, and the other escorting U.S. aircraft back. Patrol uneventful, no enemy aircraft seen. With that, I'm going to wrap this one up and move on to the 13th. So thanks again and I'll see you next time.